BRICS, or Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. There has been a lot of talk recently about BRICS in the new BRICS dollar. The relevance of BRICS becomes more salient than ever. I've mentioned the BRICS alliance and how this alliance will change the US-led world order. BRICS is not going to take over. You've heard about it by now, but if you haven't, BRICS is the new big kid on the block. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These nations are being touted as the new powerhouse collective. Think of the world like this. Developed countries like to hang out. They like to trade with each other, maybe make a military alliance or two. But what about the poor or developing countries? What's the developing country club? Well. That's kind of how BRICS came about. It was pretty innocent in the beginning, a collective of nations that could take advantage of trade and investment with each other to boost development. There's nothing wrong with some developing countries coming together for some trade agreements, right? Well, it's been spiraling out of control because it's not just about a simple trade agreement anymore. Judging by all the propaganda floating around that I've been seeing, it's kind of looking like a China-led global juggernaut that is vying for world domination. Now there's even talks of the world shifting from the US dollar-led dominance to some sort of BRICS currency or a BRICS buck, if you will. I mean, you've probably already seen the massive propaganda campaigns trying to tell you that the US dollar is dead and the Yuan from China or some other BRICS currency will take over. I've been bombarded with it. I don't know about you. Anyway, Brazil. Russia, India, China, South Africa. Now the idea is that these nations could all come together and challenge this evil hegemony of the US, which leads this group called G7 or Group of Seven. And that's not a boy band. It's a group of countries which are Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the UK. Again, led by the US and they come together based on mutual values. I mean, these BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, they could all just get along with the G7 countries, right? But that would mean that they have to play by certain rules. <clears throat> free and uh, democratic values. So what is the truth? Well, if you're from a BRICS country, you're probably not gonna like what I'm about to say. And if you're from a non-BRICS country, then you can probably rest a little bit easier knowing that your currency and economy isn't dead and about to be consumed by evil governments like the Russian or Chinese governments. Cause guess what? BRICS is fake as hell. I'll make this really, really easy to understand. Let's look at the competition. The G7, the USA, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the UK, these countries are all pretty much friends. They're all aligned in much of their policy. They're all free democracies. They are open from a visa and travel perspective. These countries pretty much dominate global policy and the general power dynamic of the globe. And they can kind of sort out their differences because they're so similar in each other's goals. So what about BRICS? Well, let's break this down into three parts. Part one is leadership. For an alliance that goes beyond simple trade, you would assume that the member states of BRICS would have to get along. Do you think China and India get along? Bro, they're pretty much at war. China and India have one of the longest standing border conflicts. Both China and India claim the Arushnal Pradesh region, and that has gotten so bad that they actually have to censor the outcomes of the very frequent attacks that happen. There's spiked clubs, there's fist fights, there's salami slicing land grabs, there is racist propaganda against the two countries from each other. So in BRICS, if the two biggest member states hate each other this much, then how the hell is any sort of alliance gonna form? Dude, China and India are not just economic rivals, they're enemies. Anyway, China is the leader in this whole situation, but a poor leader it is. <laughs> China's economy dwarfs the other member states, which would completely skew the decision-making power dynamic in the group. China has proven that its geopolitical ambitions are aggressive and nefarious. From threatening to take over Taiwan, to the militarization of the South China Sea, to the border conflict with India, China doesn't have friends. And guess what? They don't have friends for a reason. China is barely friends with the other BRICS nations. Now I want you to contrast this with the G7 countries. They're all pretty much best buddies. Speaking of friends, China isn't going to be able to align with the other nations on common policies. 
China, as you know, is pretty much just a manufacturing powerhouse. They don't do much else. While India, for example, has a very diverse economy with a growing services sector, these two countries would never be able to come up with a cohesive or unified strategy when they want different things. Don't even mention China's human rights record, by the way, which poses a massive problem. You can't get people to follow you when you act like a slave driver. From the persecution of minorities, to forced labor, to having one of the worst freedoms of press and the worst freedom of speech ratings in the entire world, China is by no means a palatable leader. China operates secretly, behind closed doors. And by the way, while we're at it, do you think the other member states of BRICS will be keen on China's intellectual property theft? Let's not beat around the bush here. China has stolen trillions of dollars of intellectual property from other countries across the globe. In fact, much of China's economy and growth is based on theft and trade imbalances with other countries. How the hell is anyone going to trust a country that not only got its position in the world thanks to IP theft, but continues to do so today? They never stopped. So how about the other candidates for leadership? Let's look at the remaining members here. Today's video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. What is a VPN? Well, it's pretty much the most important thing you could have on your computer right at this moment. But not only your computer, also your phone. What a VPN does is it encrypts your traffic so that everything you do online is hidden and no one can see what you're looking at or what you're sending or what information you're putting out there. What's more important than what you're doing online? I mean, pretty much everything you do these days is on the internet. You pay your bills, you pay your credit card, you buy stuff, you put your name, your address, and your phone number out there. So Surfshark VPN is the VPN that I use now. It's super easy to use. You can hop around to any server around the world. Not only does it keep your data safe, but you can also hop around to different countries' servers and see what the internet's like over there. For example, Let's say Netflix blocks something in your country or something's only available in England. All you have to do is go on Surfshark VPN, pop over to the England server and voila, you have all the access to all that content. If you go to surfshark.deals slash laoy86 right now, not only are you going to get a massive discount off of a two year plan, but you're also going to get three extra free months. Why not give it a shot, support the channel and protect your connection when you're online. If you are going to join or at least be threatened by the dominance of a new power, don't you think that the members of said power would actually be powerful? Don't you think that they would pose an economic threat? Well, let's look. South Africa, the S in BRICS, cannot even keep the lights on. Nearly everyone in South Africa experiences load shedding daily, meaning that the power is out. I've been speaking to people in South Africa, and while it was normal for them to experience a couple hours a day before, you know, like the, the lights go out for a couple hours a day, now it's around 12 hours per day. 12 hours a day with no electricity, no AC, no fridge, no restaurants. I mean, Actually, when I think about it, how would you run a restaurant if you don't have power? The nation is crippled with rising crime and one of the highest unemployment rates in the entire world. This is a nation on the verge of failed state status. And I honestly think they threw South Africa on the panel just so it wasn't called brick. <laughs> because brick sounds too dumb. I mean, dumb as a brick, right? That's the phrase. Now they can call it bricks. Dumb as bricks. It still works. <laughs> Anyway, maybe Russia can lead the way. Oh wait, they invaded Ukraine and their entire economy has tanked and they have to deal with being completely ostracized by the rest of the world. Russia is basically just the gas station of bricks. I mean, I guess it's a gas station with nukes, but economic powerhouse, it is not. Their entire country, the biggest country in the world, I might add, has an economy smaller than Texas. The economy of Russia, again, the biggest country in the world, is smaller than New York State. Heck, Russia's economy is only half the size of California. The truth is, Russia is under massive sanctions and its economy is shrinking. Let's look at Brazil, the B. Brazil was on a decent path economically before. A few years back, the Brazilian stock market was on fire. They reined in spending and inflation, and Brazil was actually able to bring interest rates down. So people decided that when they could no longer get 8% by investing their money in government bonds, that they should put the money in stocks. And great! The stock market went up. It looks like the state would be able to step back and maybe even unload some of those state-owned firms like in the 90s. All of a sudden, they elect in Lula, who is 
basically a tanky who will undo much of this economic progress. And suddenly, Brazil is talking about a currency union with Argentina? I mean, Argentina, who like clockwork, can't even get its spending in check and has massive inflation and may have to devalue. Instead, Lula wants to drag Brazil back into this worker's paradise BDSM dungeon for more beatings. I mean, that's the other candidate, right? So pretty much in this whole thing, India is the only really healthy state, healthy economy that looks like it could actually bring something to the table. But that brings up a very important point. Why does India need BRICS then? The truth is, is that it doesn't. India would be just fine continuing to liberalize and deregulate and grow the economy. India has been doing really, really well and even started to question their long history with Russia. So it doesn't look like anyone's gonna align here. I mean, BRICS is not a union. Union, all the BRICS countries here look like they don't even get along. But what about the currency union? Let's talk about that. That's something I'm bombarded with all the time. Heck, let's even talk about these rumors that are being slung around about a BRICS buck or whatever they're gonna call it. Imagine a competitor to the dollar dethroning the dollar, taking it down a peg and making BRICS, the BRICS currency, the currency that people start using around the globe. So part two is dethroning the dollar the BRICS currency union. Something I've seen around YouTube and articles and just media in general is that BRICS could start a currency union to replace the US dollar. Guess what? That's just not gonna happen. And if it did, it wouldn't work. Like I said before, every single one of these countries wants something different. And not only that, they have different rules. China with its strict capital controls, I mean, you can't get your money out of China. Try it, I dare you. I get emails pretty much every single day with people trying to ask me how they got their money out of China. I lived there for 10 years and let me just tell you something, I had a bear of a time getting it out. Anyway, try it. I dare you. Russia's economy is shrinking due to sanctions. And while Brazil recently made its currency freely convertible, it actually might reverse because of the new leadership. Anyway, the idea is that the BRICS currency would be backed by gold. This has got everyone worried or excited, I should say, because a lot of people have grown up not understanding how money works. And they hear that there's gonna be this new global currency and that it's backed by something real like gold, something that is more real than other currencies, I guess. By the way, I wanna ask you a question. Gold has has to be traded, right? It doesn't have inherent value until it's traded. It's not just stored in some vault accumulating value. It has to be traded with a currency. Do you know which currency gold is traded in? I'll give you a hint. Actually, I'll just tell you the answer. It's the US dollar. And guess what? Most countries keep their gold in the New York Fed vault so that bars can be moved among pallets to make payments from one country to another. So let me get this straight. BRICS is going to kill the US dollar by making a currency backed by gold, which is then traded almost completely in USD and often even kept in the United States? An economics expert I spoke to poses a great question. The question is, are they actually gonna make a currency union or a new currency that they can just choose to use? If they're proposing a true currency union, then all of those countries have to agree on a common monetary policy. That means the same interest rates, for a brick buck. Otherwise, I'll arbitrage the interest rate difference. Borrow brick bucks in a low brick interest rate country and then invest them in a high brick interest rate country. Basically extracting money from the group. Then there's the mundane issues, which would surely generate ego fights. I mean, who gets how much say on what monetary policy? Where will the central bank be located? In some central location? How about Turkey? Maybe Gibraltar? Uh, what, maybe Lieberland or Sealand? Or are they gonna make this currency optional? Like Starbucks points, but for honey or vodka or tea or oil. In that case, who cares? That's not gonna replace the dollar, right? And if it's a currency union, how much foreign exchange trade could could that replace? Well, let's go back to the BIS triennial survey. Wow, a brick buck would be involved in 10.7% of all foreign exchange trades. So they would only be one eighth of the way to replacing the dollar and still less liquid than the Great British Pound or the Japanese Yen. Also, there's some serious cheap talk coming out from China. They've also proposed the gold-backed Yuan oil trading. So if I make money from selling oil to China, I get yuan or RMB, which I can convert to gold in a Shanghai or Hong Kong bank. Great. Great. <laughs> 
I'm sure I can just fly that gold out whenever I want, once Pooh Bear approves sometime in 2042. So we have Yuan backed by gold I can never actually get my hands on, and all that's left is just to have the shills who work for the Chinese government go film some gold in vaults and show how some random person happily is getting out their gold bars. This is delusion. The dollar isn't dead, and brick bucks aren't going to be a thing. Honestly, they might as well trade in actual bricks at this point because it's not gonna work. And that leads me to part three, the final part. So why are you hearing so much about bricks? I mean, I just talked an awful lot about how it's not a thing and how it's actually kind of fake. So why do you keep hearing about it? Honestly, do you want my honest take? Because my honest take is I think you're hearing so much about the future dominance of bricks because most of the BRICS countries are struggling. China is tearing at the seams with economic downturn. Massive swaths of companies are pulling out of investments and moving elsewhere, like Vietnam. China's economy is too reliant on state-owned enterprises, which is stifling innovation. China is experiencing astronomical levels of debt. It's currently embroiled in a massive trade war with the USA, which China's economy heavily relies on. The housing market has partially collapsed, with juggernauts like property company Evergrande completely failing. Banks are not paying loans to people despite protests and then subsequent crackdowns. Not to mention the public discontent that is fomenting just beneath the surface. <clears throat> white paper protests. Don't get me started on the fact that after Xi Jinping took the reins, China is basically North Korea with more money and influence. Russia is screwed. Sanctions have crippled it. And the military death toll is far higher than when they were in Afghanistan, which to be honest, helped destroy the Soviet Union. It looks like they're on the same trajectory. And India, is trying to balancing supporting its historical ally, Russia, while at the same time, India is becoming increasingly capitalist and increasingly theocratically nationalist. And that's a route that is way more in line with the US than Russia, both culturally and militarily. South Africa is screwed too. Completely rotten from the inside out with corruption, power outages, unemployment. It actually looks like South Africa is on a path from which there is no return. Brazil is under new unpredictable leadership, counter to the things that made Brazil great in the first place. You see, BRICS nations, under the leadership of China, like to tout anti-America propaganda. The USA, or the West in general, is doomed. Look at society collapsing. Look at the economy imploding. Look at how desperate and dangerous life is for Americans. The future is not with the USA, it's with us. China or Russia, but in fact, nothing has changed. Let me blow your mind for a second. This is from a 1957 film about how Americans can spot propaganda. I want you to look at this and tell me if anything has changed. And today, America cries peace, peace, to further the blessings of peace, to ensure peace, America today sends to every nation in her imperialist orbit the implement of peace, ammunition, rifles, bayonets, hand grenades, machine guns, bombing planes, fighter planes, and now even atomic cannon. The gentlemen from America may call that peace, but I have another word for it. I call it war. I call it America's Part of the plan to enslave the world. I don't think you need three guesses to know what this is all about. But let's listen a moment longer and see what's behind it. Peace, Peace is what the whole world yearns for, prays for, longs for. But on Wall Street, it is a world that has been ruined. I say let the American warmongers beware. The people want peace. And, and we, we are, are the voice of the people. people. That was the voice of the Kremlin, or rather, one of its voices. There are lots of them around the world, speaking in every language. I think you can see this all for what it is. It's propaganda. Now, go rest easy. Go outside. Enjoy your day. Put your phone down, stop reading the news. Strike up a conversation with a neighbor. Bricks, under China's leadership, isn't gonna eat your lunch. They can barely make their own. 
If you enjoyed this, you probably will enjoy my live show that I have every single Friday called The China Show. I examine in depth everything that is going on in China at the moment. It's all the current events. It's a live show on Friday, but you can watch it afterwards. You don't have to be there live. I highly recommend you go subscribe to that channel. You're absolutely going to love it, I promise. And don't forget that I have a secret show every single Monday. It's called Xiaoban Ho, or After Work, where I discuss and show all the things that I can't show on YouTube, if you catch my drift. So, links are down below. Don't forget to check them out. And I want to say thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll catch you on the next one.